Life in Northern Australia is full of spectacular surprises and natural hazards, some more obvious than others. Fires, floods, venomous stingers, animals with lots of teeth. But there's something else that hardly anyone knows anything about. It's ancient, it's practically invisible, it can kill you within 48 hours, and it's living right here beneath my feet. Meet Burkholderia pseudomallei. It's a native bacterium that lives in water and soil, but it doesn't stop there. This bacteria is highly versatile. It manages to colonise pretty much everything. And when that includes us, it causes a disease called miliodosis. Think of us as accidental um, consequences of being caught in the crossfire. People with chronic health problems like diabetes, lung disease and heavy alcohol use are most at risk. But definitely deadly for, unfortunately, still too many people. Over the last two decades, miliodosis has claimed 107 lives in the Northern Territory, nine in the last year alone. If you're sensible, if you don't walk around in bare feet in muddy areas, you know, if you look after any cuts and scrapes and other things that you might get while you're in the top end, then you're not going to get miliodosis. But recent wet seasons in the north have seen more infections than ever before. If it happened to me, it could happen to you or your, your friend, your wife, your husband, your neighbour. To follow the Meliodosis Trail, I've come to the wild north of tropical Australia. From here in the Kimberley, right across northern Australia through Darwin into Townsville, this is the front line for Meliodosis research in the world's tropics. The first step in mapping the risk of Meliodosis find out where the microbes live. As they drive across the Kimberley, microbiologists Tim Ingalls and Adam Merritt sample soil at river crossings every 100 kilometres or so. You like to draw big conclusions over a big area. We're trying to do that with an even more challenging task, which is a very small beastie you can't even see with a naked eye. It's probably take I'm put to work at the cutting edge of this research. A new one for science, A eh? new one for science, the first sample from this spot. What might you find? Might find the original Burkholderia, <laughs> you never know. That's it, oh perfect. Got nice, greeny, fine clay mud sort right. of consistency. Good habitat for bugs. Yeah. This is the natural habitat of Burkholderia pseudomallei. The bacteria aren't trying to invade us, we just end up colliding with them. These are the sharks of the soil. Uh, they're out there, they're minding their own business, they're in a habitat that they're comfortable with and then we go and stumble into it. Studying how they coexist with other life forms, like living inside amoebae, provides clues to how they infect humans. They can survive for a very long time in water, but we think they may be able to survive even longer in amoebae. And there's a possibility that's where they may have learnt how to live inside cells, such as cells of the human body. Tim and Adam have put a state-of-the-art genetics lab in the back of their car to analyse the samples for microbial DNA while on the road. These environmental pathogens are quite difficult to find, especially during the dry season. And we believe that the further you transport the samples, the more likely you are to get a false negative result by getting the equipment into the field, we're getting closer to where those organisms are and hopefully we'll get a higher positive rate. We'll return to see whether they do. On the other side of the border, the Darwin Hospital is dealing with a surge in the number of meliodosis cases. There's been this big change. So in summary, over the last three years, we've had 252 cases, which is way bigger than we would have expected from our previous figures. The last season we had 30 patients in intensive care and at the beginning of the 2000s we would probably have about 8 or 10. So it has significantly increased. It waxes and wanes, depending on usually how big the wet season is. It's taken Paul Griggs months to recover from the last wet season when he was struck down by the simple act of mowing the lawn. As you can see, a rural block, a lot of grass. So there's a fair bit of mowing. I jabbed myself in the leg, which opened a wound. No, not a major issue, but given the amount of muck that's been thrown out from the mower, 
that's how the infection entered the body. But not just gardeners are at risk. Helen Bateman believes she caught meliodosis at her city apartment. It's a nice spot. Beautiful, yes. We like it. It's her uh, did this for the reason that we didn't have to garden on weekends. <laughs> <laughs> From the meliodosis and being so sick, I've had uh, other issues that have arisen, kidneys, liver, um, pancreas. So I'm now unfortunately on insulin on a daily basis. And yeah, so it's a terrible disease. That's dramatically changed your life. Absolutely. Helen's life was saved by a lengthy stay in intensive care. We've had terrific outcomes in the last 10 years compared to the previous 10 years when most of the patients who came to intensive care with meliodosis would die. The treatment aims to kill the bacteria with antibiotics, stop blood poisoning and boost the patient's immune system. Now we have a 25% mortality rate down from 95% um, previously. That's a dramatic decrease. It's a dramatic decrease. We mostly see it in the lungs in intensive care, causing very serious pneumonia. Um, but we also have to go hunting for where it's hiding. And it can be in the liver, the spleen, the kidneys. You can see all the black areas are actually areas of infection, abscesses within the liver. And if you can see this really big area here, it's <sighs> seven centimetres. This big one here is what we're looking at draining. There are three ways the bacteria enter the body through open wounds in the skin, in drinking water, or into the lungs when inhaled. It's a very resistant and resilient little organism. They also colonise plants, and Darwin is growing grassy highways that spread the bacteria directly into the city. Weeds like mission and tully grass spread quickly along drainage channels and into the bush, providing ideal habitat. These roots all excrete nutrients, and these nutrients are just them um, paradise for the bacteria. It is pretty much their food. This is the dry season in Darwin, and it should be a tough time for soil bacteria to survive. But with the spread of introduced grasses, like these that keep the soil moister for longer, the meliodosis bacteria can thrive in the parks and backyards all year round. That means that the public is now potentially more exposed to this bacteria even in the dry season. But so far, we haven't really seen this translated into cases. Luckily, we haven't seen it happening yet. For more than a decade, Mark Mayo has been keeping an eye out. I'm part Indigenous, so half the cases of meliodosis have been Indigenous people in the Northern Territory. So it sort of relates to me and I've had family members that have had it as well. His lab at the Menzies School for Health Research cultures bacteria from hundreds of soil, water and air samples. The aim is to pinpoint the meliodosis hotspots and find explanations for the surge in infections. Unchlorinated bore water supplies are sampled on rural properties to try and match bacteria with clinical cases. What we found was that out of 55 of them, uh, 18 were positive for the presence of the bacteria. Even though that's around 30% of the water we found positive, we don't see 30% of the people living in rural areas coming in. We really don't understand the environmental uh, aspects of this organism. We don't understand about its dispersal and we actually don't understand its virulence. Another key question is the extent to which the bacteria are carried by air and dispersed by high winds and heavy rain. One theory is that soil disturbed by construction activity, whipped up in the cyclone season, may partly explain Darwin's increase in meliodosis cases. It rings true for Helen, who fell sick during a cyclone. The rain was so heavy that it would actually bubble up through this um, downpipe. Strange to think that something from a cyclone could just come and pick you up on here. my lob on my little veranda up here <laughs> and knock you for six. Yeah. yeah. There's enough capacity for airborne infection that the US lists this microbe as a potential biological weapon, along with anthrax or Ebola. Over in the Kimberley, Tim Ingalls has found links between cyclone tracks and outbreaks of meliodosis. If, as a result of climate change, we see more of those severe weather events bringing soil and dust storms, and especially moist soil, in from the Northern Territory across 
Western Australia, we are going to see more cases of disease. That means development in the north could have major implications for public health with the expansion of suburbs, mining and agriculture, such as the Ord Irrigation Scheme. That irrigation scheme needs to be monitored and monitored very closely because if it's not managed carefully, we could end up with a number of health threats. There are two global epicenters for meliodosis, North Australia and Southeast Asia, where the death rates in agricultural areas are much higher. The meliodosis bacteria still call Australia home. Over hundreds of millions of years, they evolved here and moved to Southeast Asia around the time of the last ice age. And that's important for research because it means that the ancient Australian strains are the ancestors to the rest of the world. What we learn from the ancestral strains here could be the key to saving lives elsewhere by developing a simple diagnostic test and perhaps a vaccine. At the end of the road in the Kimberley, the genetics lab on wheels confirms the presence of Burkholderia DNA only 24 hours after sampling the soil. Well, this is good. We've got two positives out of the four that we tested. That's a higher hit rate than we normally expect. Not only are there more spots on the meliodosis map, they may have found a new strain of bacteria. That suggests that we've got a greater load of these organisms present locally, and this is a place worth looking at uh, in much greater detail linking microbiology in a creek bed to clinical research at a hospital bed is crucial for learning to live with the meliodosis bug. In the end, when a patient gets better and they come back and they say thank you very much, that's what our job's all about. That's what makes it worthwhile.